Welcome to Becoming Ellie, podcast episode number 20. Hi, I'm Jill. Welcome back to Becoming Ellie, where women over 50 inspire each other to become fit and strong. Hi, I'm Chris. Our community is named for the Norse goddess of aging named Ellie, who was working to stay fit and strong. She surprised everyone when she beat Thor in a wrestling match. We're so glad you're listening to our podcast, and we encourage you to visit our website, www.becomingelly.com, join our private Facebook group, and sign up for our mailing list. We're excited to build this community of strong and fit women by sharing healthy tips, workout ideas, and developing information to motivate and inspire our group to stay fit and strong as we get older. Today, we'll be talking with Janet Palco. In the spring of 2018, Janet took the epic journey of her lifetime when she walked the Camino del Santiago in Spain. Janet's decision to walk the Camino was a result of what she called the trifecta of life changes all at once. The end of a long-term relationship, a move to a different community, and retirement from a 28-year career where she built a business that meant a great deal to her. Since essentially everything about day-to-day -day life was changing, she was looking for something big to look forward to, as well as a chance to reflect about whether she was on the right path for this next chapter of life. The Camino could deliver that. The Camino is a pilgrimage to the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela in northwest Spain, where it is said that the remains of St. James the Apostle are buried. The Camino de Santiago is not just one route. Thousands of people walking from their homes throughout the Middle Ages paved many roads all over Europe, but they all come together like branches of a tree and all arrive at Santiago. Today, thousands of people cover those same routes each year, some for spiritual reasons, others for physical or adventure challenges, but they are all considered pilgrims along the way. One of the longest and most traveled routes is the Camino Francis, so named for the starting point in northwestern France. Over the Pyrenees and across all of northern Spain, Janet covered around 800 kilometers. That's about 500 miles. Wow. Janet was fairly confident that she could manage the physical aspect of the Camino and knew that she could embrace the social aspect. Janet was finally able to commit to the trip when she realized that any time she wasn't feeling it, she could stop and make a new plan since she was traveling solo and her decision would not affect anyone else. So she booked a flight told everyone her plan, and embarked on her excellent adventure with nothing but a backpack loaded with the barest necessities to manage six weeks walking across the entire country of Spain. Please join us as we welcome Janet Palco on the 20th episode of Becoming Ellie. Welcome, Janet, to Becoming Ellie. We're thrilled to have you on the podcast. Yes, welcome. Thanks. I am, I am so excited to be doing this with you. Yeah, we're excited to hear about your adventures. So why don't we begin by you just telling a little bit about your background and a little bit about yourself. Well, I like a lot of the listeners here, I expect I am recently retired. I had my own business for 28 years, and I like to say that Hard work led to good luck in my career, and I was able to retire a little bit early. But I had great nervousness about that because, like any entrepreneur, a lot of your identity is all wrapped up in the business that you built and the business you created. And I was a little bit afraid to leave that. So retirement presented some nervousness for me, but now I can say being eight months into retirement, I'm one of those people mm -hmm. who are saying, why did I wait so long? <laughs> well, that's <laughs> great to hear. Is, yeah, this is so far the greatest job I've ever had. You know, I really haven't heard anyone say, I hate retirement. <laughs> I <Yeah>. just... <laughs> well, I have heard people say, you know, I, I, it's a real transition and I 
my identity is different, particularly entrepreneurs. Yeah. And also because I had a work family, I was very involved in in the lives of the 16 people who worked with me and took a great interest in mentoring them. And I thought, well, what am I going to do for thrills after after I'm not doing that every single day? So I was kind of looking for some thrills after retirement. Okay. Can you tell us what you are currently doing to get fit or stay fit? Well, I'm, I'm not the type of person that likes to go to a gym. No matter how nice the place is, it just feels too confined. So pretty much anything I can do outside. When I was 40, I took up running because that was the only thing that fit in the life of, of uh, carting around two young boys that were into every sport. But I had to give that up after about a dozen years because it started affecting my body. So now, whatever I do is, is whatever I can be more gentle on my body. I love to cross-country ski in the wintertime. I love to ride my bike. But... My go-to every day and my first choice is always hiking. I just love being out in the woods and I love being outside. And it's something here, especially in Northeast Ohio, that you can do every day and get a lot of variety. That's definitely true. We, yeah. we're, we're lucky to have so many trails and parks. And... Mm -hmm. So how did you get started doing all of that? I mean, particularly hiking. Well, I think I was lucky. I, my childhood memories, I remember going to Mohican Forest every Sunday after church with the whole family, and mom and dad and four kids would go hiking on all the trails in, Mo, in Mohican. And maybe it was just those happy childhood memories that that gave me a love of being out in the woods. But it was also something I could do when my kids were young and I was a single parent, very poor. Going out into the parks and going hiking on the fall hiking spree was something that we could do for free. Mm -hmm. And and the kids enjoyed it. You know, I had two active young boys and, and they could just burn off some of their energy running around in the woods. But I just truly love it and try to take one vacation a year that's a national park vacation that's all centered around hiking in different parks around the U.S. Oh, what a wonderful idea. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the trips that you've taken in the U.S. that maybe prepared you for this big one? Well, I think the most recent one was a couple of years ago, going to Rocky Mountain National Park. That that had the best opportunity that I've ever experienced for really, really long hikes that would take all day long, where you're hiking 10 or 12 miles up and down ridge lines and, and getting a lot of elevation gain and loss. That's when I realized that I could actually walk all day long and carry a little bit of weight and, and still be alive at the end of the day. <laughs> but, but, but I have to admit, it still didn't prepare me for the thought of of doing that kind of hiking every day and then getting up and doing it again the next day and the next day and the next day for weeks on end. That that was a real stretch. How but, long was your Rocky Mountain hike? How many days? Well, we were there for 10 days and we hiked every single day. But you, they, they were all day hikes, not backpacking. And the hikes that we would do in the day varied anywhere from six miles to 12 miles. Okay. So nothing extreme there. Well, I don't know. I'd kind of call that extreme <laughs> for, for someone who doesn't hike very far or high, I guess. Now, I seem to remember that you had – Traveled to the Grand Canyon, is that right? Is that one of the hikes you did? Oh, that was that was quite a long time ago, but I did get a great opportunity to do a rim-to-rim -rim backpacking trip with a group of people. And in that trip, we started on the North Rim, and we spent two days hiking down to the bottom because we carried everything in, our stove, our food, our sleeping bags, everything. 
And it was in September, and the forecast said no rain. So we, there were six of us, and we opted not to take our tents and just sleep under the stars because it was 110 degrees at the bottom. Oh, my. <laughs> Were there. Are you so we kidding? It was really hot. But that was really a, a life-changing experience for me to spend those five days in the Grand Canyon and have time to do the side hikes and, and to camp out every single night under the stars. It was just really, really an exciting and spiritual thing for me. And that's when I knew that 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 kind of a vacation and trekking was the best way for me to to experience an area. Yeah. Wow. That's that sounds absolutely incredible. It was. It was very very fun. I don't think I could ever duplicate that again. Especially at the end when you get to the top of uh, of the south rim of the Grand Canyon and you look across and we all had, you know, our full backpacks on and the, the people at the top who, who never go below the rim were saying, wow, where did you come from? And we could point across and say, over there. <laughs> and oh that, that's what it seemed like really something to do. It never feels like something in the moment. But when you're all done and you look back at what you did, you go, wow, that was really cool. You know, but on the other hand, we encountered people each day that were running and they were ultra runners and they would run the canyon rim to rim. Oh, my no. goodness. I know. It was it was insane. Wow. Wow. I I didn't even know that was a thing. It's a thing. <laughs> wow. So, Janet, approximately what was your age when you did the Grand Canyon hike? If you don't mind me asking. I was... 49. 49. Okay. Interesting. Man, that just sounds so exciting. That really does sound like the trip of a lifetime. But then you went on another trip of a lifetime. Mm -hmm. More, that, yes, much more recently. <laughs> yes. Why don't you just give us a little bit of background? Okay. So the trip, the Camino de Santiago. And the Camino is actually a pilgrimage route in Spain that began literally hundreds of years ago in the medieval times. And it was formed because thousands of people would walk from their homes throughout the Middle Ages towards one place, uh, Santiago de Compostela, which is a, a, a city in Spain, where is, it is said that the bones of St. James the Apostle are buried. So today, thousands of people cover the same routes every year to make their pilgrimage. It's not so much a religious trek now as it is uh, more of a spiritual reasons or a physical or adventure challenge for people. But everyone is considered a pilgrim along the way. And there's actually 13 different Camino routes that start from different different spots in Spain or in that area of Europe, but they all end in Santiago. So it, it is, it is an epic walk, but it's, it's not like walking the Pacific trail or, or the Appalachian trail where you're in the woods and camping. This is really more of a, a village to village walk. And mm -hmm. sure you're in the woods sometimes, but a lot of times you're also on, farm roads and sometimes you're you're passing through major cities but you're in the particular route I took it was called the Camino Francais because it actually starts in France and you cross into Spain and you walk all up across the northern part of Spain oh wow so that was my big adventure that I chose to do I can't even tell you how I first heard about it. I, I might have seen some article in National Geographic or something like that, and it mm -hmm. stuck in my head. But it was not really something I ever thought I could do, and I thought it was would require a travel agent and somebody arranging it and scheduling it. Okay. And, and then I met somebody 
the year before I went, it was a woman about my age who had gone and done it her, alone. And she told me about her, her experience and about how you really didn't need an itinerary. You didn't need anybody to organize anything for it. And you did not need a travel companion. And that, really? Yeah. Yeah. And that's when I really started to think about it seriously. And it just so happened when I met her, I was, you know, facing what I call the perfect trifecta in my life of change. I had ended a long-term relationship. I had moved to a new community and I knew I was going to retire in six months. And so literally everything about my day-to-day -day life was changing. So I thought, what could I do that would be a big adventure that would completely take me outside of my normal life so that I would have time to you know, think and be reflective and, and have something great to look forward to after retirement? So the Camino just kind of checked off all those boxes and I made the commitment to go. I just wondered how many miles your trip was and how many days you were on it. So the Camino Francais is, is one of the longest routes. It is about 800 kilometers, which is 500 miles, oh from the starting point, which is in saint jean pied de port in France. And that is in the Pyrenees Mountains. And when you end in Santiago de Compostela, it's almost to the coast, to the Atlantic coast, but it's 87 kilometers short. So that actually took me 31 days walking. And that was because only because in the middle region of Spain, which is really the only flat part of the whole walk, there's about five or six days of walking where it's just flat. It's fields, 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 fields. And I chose to ride a bike through that section. It's called the Meseta. Mm -hmm. And with four other ladies that I met along the, the way, we rented bikes in Burgos and we rode bikes for three days to Leon and then dropped off our bikes there. So what would have taken us six or seven days only took us three days. And I was able to accelerate a little bit that way. But wow. On the walking days, I averaged about 15 miles a day. Wow. Wow, that's a lot of walking. Yeah, yes. but you know what? You, you have all day. <laughs> so, <laughs> I guess so, yeah. <laughs> because you literally have nothing else to do. <laughs> wow. So. so before you left, uh, what have, challenges were you most concerned about? Like before, when you were just in the planning stages and you were thinking about it, you know, what, what did, what issues did you think you'd come into? Well, I mean, I did have con some concerns about the physical aspects because, you know, while I knew I could, I could hike 12 to 15 miles, I didn't know if I could do that day after day after day. And then I also didn't know if I could do it carrying a backpack because you have to understand that when I was in Spain for six weeks, Everything that I had for that entire six week trip was in my backpack. So it was 20 pounds of my life wow. was on my back and you had to carry it everywhere. So it, it makes a huge difference on the bottom of your feet carrying that weight. And so that was the only training that I did. I mean, I just went out into the Cuyahoga Valley National Park and picked the hilliest routes I could and I carried that full backpack. And I started doing that, I think, in September. And I went on the Camino in April. So every time I every time I went for a hike, even if it was around the lake in my neighborhood, I had my full my full pack on. <laughs> my neighbors got to know oh, Janet's training for her Camino. <laughs> How many pairs yeah. of shoes did you take with you? One. 
because who <laughs> wants to carry that extra weight? These shoes ended up being the greatest purchase of my life. Perfect for me. And I also took some Tiva sandals so that I would have something to put on, you know, at night and something to wear in the shower. And that's the only footwear that I had. And I have to tell you, when, when I ended the walk, on the coast of Spain, traditional for the pilgrims to burn everything that they had there, including their shoes. But, you know, they don't want to burn anything anymore. But I did leave my shoes behind on a rock right wow. on the Atlantic coast wow. because they were they were they were trash by then. Huh. You know, <laughs> what kind of shoes were they? They were Oboz, uh, O-B-O-Z. I bought them at Appalachian Outfitters. Oh, maybe I shouldn't say that and <laughs> give them a plug, but they were just... That's okay. <laughs> it was the perfect shoe for me because I had a really wide toe box. Oh, I have to tell you, I saw some epic blisters on the Camino where I, I just couldn't, couldn't believe somebody's feet could get that messed up. And I walked 500 miles and did not get a blister except... I made a blister the very last day of walking, and I don't know why. Wow. So I thought that that was pretty ironic. <laughs> and it was my signal to stop walking. <laughs> <laughs> that and coming to the ocean, or yes, the, the end yes. of the hike. <laughs> there was that, too. <laughs> oh, it, it seems too long of a thing to be called a hike. To the end of the pilgrimage, I guess, is, is what the right way to say it, right? Yes, or as, as many of the people that I met there, they all, they called it a walking holiday. <laughs> so, a walking holiday, I like that. A walking holiday. Okay. Yeah. So I, you were preparing. You had only 20 pounds in your pack. Mm -hmm. Can you describe some of the things that you would take or maybe more importantly, what you wouldn't take? Oh, yeah, that probably is more important, but... So, so keep in mind the full water bottle and the pack itself was six pounds. So I only had another 12 to 14 pounds to play around with for everything that I, I needed, not counting my shoes because I was wearing them most of the time that I was walking. I had my Tevas. You basically would have two changes of clothing, you know, what you were going to hike in and then a similar outfit to have a clean set. So that meant you you did laundry pretty much every single night. And everywhere that you would stay in these hostels, they would have some sort of facility, either, either sometimes if you're lucky, an actual washing machine, but usually a sink and a, and a clothesline. And everybody was rinsing out their things and hanging them up in the afternoon when they got in. It was the first thing that you did. So other than your two changes of clothing, you might have, you know, one other simple thing, like I took a little knit dress to put on in the evenings, thinking that would be a comfortable thing. Mm -hmm. Well, I did wear it, but I also wore it on top of everything else that I brought because it was unseasonably cold. So a lot of times in the evening, you had to wear every layer that you had. Oh. So I had an oh. extra layer of a long sleeve T-shirt. I would put the dress over that. I would put my tights on and underneath the dress <laughs> because it was so chilly at night. Also had to take, I took a silk liner to sleep in. I did not take a sleeping bag because I usually sleep hot and I figured if it was cold, I could just wear all my clothes to mm -hmm. bed, which I did often and so did a lot of other people. Usually when you would stay in the hostels, the hostels were really kind of great. They were all clean and they all had adequate bathrooms. But sometimes what you got was a bunk bed with kind of like those rubberized pillows and mattresses and no sheets. Most oh. Only about half the time would they give you sheets. So it was nice to have that silk liner to have something between you and the bed. But they did have blankets. Oh, okay. Being in a rustic rural area of the country and being in a highly trafficked hostel or albergue, as they call them, you know, the concern about bed, bed bugs was real. So you wanted something between you and the blanket they gave you. Uh, and so that's where the oh silk my. liner. <laughs> yeah, that's where the silk liner that I treated with permethrin came in. 
But I have to tell you, I never, ever, ever saw or heard of any incidences of bed bugs. Well, that's very reassuring. Yeah. And it might have been the time of year because it was still cold. The warm weather hadn't set in. So I don't know. But you said this was in April. Yes. I okay. started in I started walking on April 20th and uh, finished towards the end of May. Wow. How oh, I didn't have I didn't have qualms about the physical aspect of it. I was pretty sure I could do it. I, I was ready to embrace the social aspect of it, but I, I was nervous about some other thing, you know, becoming lonely once in a while. The, the communal sleeping arrangements. Mm-hmm. I wasn't really down for that, but I figured I would get over it, and I did. Wow. So when you were on the trail and in the hostels, how many people would be doing this at the same time? How many, how many roughly would be in the hostel with you? Well, it depended. I mean, some of the hostels were very, very small. Some of them were huge. Occasionally, I, I would end up with a room to myself. One time, I was in a room with 32 other people. Oh my. Uh, but a typical hostel room would have anywhere from you know, 10 to 15 people in it. And there, there's no girls' room or guys' room. They just, you know, they just send you into the room in the order you walk in the door. So it's a real mixed bag, you know, men and women, people from all over the world speaking all these different languages. One thing that I learned is everybody snores. I mean, everybody (laughs) snores. And and those, those days that I would get in there and go, oh, it's all women in here or mostly women around me. I'll be lucky. No, they snore too. (laughs) (laughs) So what did you bring? Did you bring anything with you to help for sleeping like earplugs or an eye mask or? Oh yeah. Yeah. I actually, I actually brought the foam earplugs, which helped somewhat, but it just deadened the noise. And then a friend that I made came up one night, and that was the night that we were in the room with 32 people and said, here, try these. And he he had these silicone earplugs. He said, jam the foam ones in your ear and then put this in over top of it. And it was magical. It was like being underwater and you couldn't hear a thing. Oh, that's wonderful. 32 so, people, I can't imagine. Yeah, I mean, I, I slept like a dead person. But, I mean, even though it was noisy and I thought it would be weird to sleep in a room with all those people, you're just so tired at the end of the day that, you know, once you get in there and lay down and get comfortable, you just go to sleep. Mm-hmm. You know? And there's no sleeping in because people start getting up at pre-dawn and, you know, mm-hmm. packing their bags and making noise. So you just give up and get up with them. Right. So obviously you met people as you journeyed. And you did say you rode the bikes with, with a couple of women that yes. you met. Would you be with people for a certain period of time and then separate? Or or how did that work? Yes, that's exactly what happened. Let me back up a little bit. When I decided to go, you know, I, of course going solo was one of the scariest things. But Really, in reality, the the most nerve wracking thing was the logistics of getting from Akron to my starting point, because I really was on my own. It was, you know, I was in a foreign mm-hmm. country. I had missed flights and all of that. But once I got once I got to St. John, then all of a sudden I was I was there surrounded by pilgrims and everybody that was there was doing the same thing I was. So when you get up and you start walking in the morning, even though you're alone, there's people ahead of you and behind you that are doing the same thing that you're doing every single day. From the very beginning, on on the first couple of nights, I I met a couple of people and we stuck together for a few days and walked together. You know, then people have their own pace and somebody will want to stop for a night and you don't. So I learned that art of being with somebody for a couple of days and then you separate and then you meet some new people and you separate. But it ended up being one of the most enjoyable things of the Camino to have made a friend and and be missing them. And then two or three weeks later, you run into them. And you have have this great reunion. And it it is is really just what was a really happy thing. Other people will 
create a Camino family within the first two or three days and travel as a group and never separate through the entire thing. So wow. I also met people who did that. And, you know, so, so they had that experience and made those friendships. I don't regret the way I did it, but I have to admit that, that some days I would find myself completely alone, walking alone for hours, because in spite of the fact there's so many other people on the road, some sometimes inexplicably you wouldn't see people for hours. And <laughs> those were those days that, those were those days of reflection <laughs> mm-hmm. where, where you, you walk in your own thoughts. And I have to admit there were, there was one period of time where I, I was walking alone for most of two or three days. And I was really sick of my own company by the end of that. Mm-hmm. Wow. So I would assume that you were not the only person traveling alone, but that there would have been also people who were traveling with a companion. Yes. yes. I, but I was, I was surprised by how many people had gone to the Camino alone. And it didn't mean that they were single people. You know, a lot of times uh, I met many women, married women that were there. Either their spouse was still working or they weren't interested. So they went on their own. People of all ages. The ones that really impressed me were the very, very young girls. I met a lot of young girls, and I'm talking 19 or 20 years old, from Australia or the UK that went there all by themselves. And they were clearly walking on a very, very limited budget because they were, you know, looking for the cheapest places to stay and not going to the cafes, but, you know, going to buy bread and cheese somewhere and just kind of doing it on a shoestring. But with no fear of going there all by wow. themselves. And I, w- I was pretty impressed by that. And it made me realize how in the U.S. we're, we're much, much less adventurous about that because, you know, kids here don't get that international travel exposure, you know, because the U.S. is such a big country that a lot of people, you know, never leave the country until they're adults, if then. Right. So that was really eye-opening for me. Did you have any issues with a language barrier? No, really very few people did. I mean, English really is the universal language. Um, Most of the people that I met were not Americans. They were from all over Europe, and most of them spoke pretty good English. Where we went in Spain along the way, because it was the Camino and the pilgrimage, you know, then then the hostel hosts and the cafe owners all knew the basic English that that they needed to deal with us. I know a little Spanish, and I was polishing it up before I went. So often I would be the one in the group that had the best Spanish, which was kind of scary. <laughs> but, <laughs> But no, I mean, even even if you had no Spanish whatsoever, it, you could easily do, go to the Camino and, and do it. No wow. problems. So one thing I've been thinking through all of this, what did you eat? How did you plan your meals? How much did you have to carry? Did you buy things at the I mean, I have a lot of questions around food. Well, um, that actually wasn't a big deal because every few kilometers you're meet, you're encountering a village usually. And because this is, is such a well-traveled route, I hate to call it a tourism because it isn't really anything like any tourism you've ever experienced. But all of these villages are equipped to handle the pilgrims that come through. So you could always count on every five kilometers or so finding a cafe to get a cup of coffee, to get a basic breakfast, to get a, a bocadilla, you know, the cheese and ham sandwich or a cup of stew or something like that. So we didn't have to take food except on a few occasions. I did take a guidebook so that I knew what was coming up in the next 20 or 30 kilometers. And in the guidebook, they would warn you if you were going to have a long stretch of, say, more than 10 kilometers where you weren't going to encounter any facilities, you know, no cafes, no bathrooms, no food, no water. And they would tell you to be sure to take something. 
And in those cases, you would just stop at a, at a little market or the bakery and get a sandwich or some cheese and make sure you had that. But I rarely had anything other than some basic nuts and chocolate snacks. And that was it. I didn't other, have to take a lot of food. Okay, that's kind of nice. And then you said you carried a water bottle mm -hmm. with you? Yeah, I actually used a bladder, uh, a camelback bladder, because I threw that to okay. not have to carry it and have the convenience of, of the little mouthpiece. I didn't, I got to a point where I wouldn't even fill that up all the way because water was so readily available. Anywhere you stopped, the cafe owners were happy to refill your water bottle. So, they were very accommodating in that. All of the water in Spain was potable, so you didn't have to worry about getting sick from the water or anything like that. Oh, that's good to know, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wondered if if you had to, like, fill up from a pump or something, you know, where, you know, I try to picture it, and I, I didn't realize there were that many villages along the way. Yeah, and, but sometimes you were filling up from a pump. And if it wasn't drinkable, they would have a sign on it. So you you, you could fill it with confidence. If not, uh, what was what was surprising is how readily you were also given free wine. Wine. <laughs> wine. Oh, the nice. Wine was flowing in Spain. Um, if you had a if you had a dinner at a cafe or um, in the hostel, they would often have pilgrims dinners where you could just pay an extra 10 euros and and everybody would meet for a communal meal and they some of them were better than others but they were always really hearty but at every meal you got the unlimited basket of bread and carafes of wine set on the table and when the carafe was empty they just picked it up and refilled it <laughs> so wow there was even one kind of famous point about halfway in the Camino where there is a fountain that that um, dispenses red wine. <laughs> and, it's, <laughs> and it's at the entry of the Rioja region of Spain, which is famous for its red wine. So people were stopping and filling their water bottles with the wine. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> yeah, I wonder. They probably didn't walk that far that day. <laughs> well... Well, I, I took a, a sip of the wine and then just uh, passed on filling my water bottle because because I had to show some kind of restraint. I happened by it at nine o'clock in the morning, so oh, yeah. that's I wanted to. Okay. So, what about wildlife? Did you encounter any it animals was, or? Well, tons of animals, but that whole northern part of Spain is very rural, so it, it was uh, livestock farming or crop farming. So we were constantly going by fields with sheep and horses and cows and all of that sort of domestic animals. But when we got to Galicia, which was the last region in Spain before you get into Santiago, that is almost like Tolkien enchanted woodlands. And we did mm. see a fair number of, you know, fox and, and that sort of wildlife. But no, it was mostly domesticated animals just in mass quantities. Of them. <laughs> and, and there was more than once where you just had to wait on a road or a trail and wait for this gigantic herd of sheep to cross or cattle to cross on the road. Huh. Have the trails been functioning actually since the Middle yes, Ages? Yes, literally. I mean, some of the places that, that we stayed would be converted monasteries or convents where original pilgrims were welcomed and they stayed, you know, 800 years ago or 600 years ago. Uh, but, you know, I, I imagine that, that until recent years, the, the path was, had a lot less support and a lot less accommodations than it does now. I'm sure a lot of people knew about the Camino throughout the ages, but it really didn't get popularized until the 80s. So it's only been in the past two or three decades that it's been kind of high on people's radar 
and and the number of pilgrims walking the Camino has grown so greatly. I'm sure there's a lot of people who who discovered it, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, maybe when they were young, they walked it and might say they would have nothing to do with it today because it's so crowded. Mm -hmm. And I I can imagine that it is very crowded in the peak months in the summer, which is why I chose to go in, in the spring. That and the fact that I don't like heat. It's just brutally hot on the Camino in the summer months. They have a count in Santiago. When you reach the pilgrim's office, you can get a certificate of completion that's called a Compostela. That if you can prove that you walked at the very least the last hundred kilometers of the Camino, you can get your Compostela. So they take account of the pilgrims that arrive in Santiago each day that way. So at the time that I was walking, the count was something like seven or 800 pilgrims a day were arriving yeah. in in Santiago. And then by the time I got there, that number had grown to a thousand and then it goes double that in the summer months. I don't I don't think I would want to be there in the summer months either. Mm-hmm. But other people embrace it and really like what for some become like the moving party of the Camino. <laughs> okay. Was there anything you wished you had done differently in preparation or when you were traveling? Well, I have to say I was really happy with my choices of what I took in my backpack. There's nothing that I didn't use and nothing that I would have wanted to do without. I think as far as my whole experience of the Camino, I think maybe something I might have done differently is I would have been a little bolder at the beginning about talking to people. I mean, while I did make friends and I talked to those people at the beginning, I was hesitant when somebody was walking, you know, as a couple or single I was hesitant to talk to them more than give them a greeting because I was maybe being too respectful of, oh, maybe they're on their contemplative Camino and they're out there alone for a reason. So they don't want somebody yammering in their ear. And so I guess I was being a little aloof that way. And then once I had walked on my own enough and realized, well, I'm walking alone, but I would still welcome company. I was a little bolder about that. And that's actually when my Camino got a lot better because I did end up having some really incredible conversations with people. I mean, I was so surprised at how much somebody would tell me after knowing me only 20 minutes. And then just having a real connection with them when I did run into them two weeks later, it was really, Mm. it was really kind of nice. So I've, I've never had that experience where I meet a stranger and then it goes something beyond that encounter or that vacation or whatever. Uh, There's probably six or eight people that I met on the Camino that I'm still in regular contact with. I have already, since I returned in June, I've already had three Camino reunions with people that I met on the way. Really? Yes. And one of them was just last night. Uh, This woman happened to be in Cleveland visiting her son who goes to Case Western Reserve. And so she contacted me and told me when she'd be there. We met for dinner and then went to a concert where he was performing there. So it, it was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And then another person was visiting Cleveland and we got together for a couple of days and I took her to the national park and we went hiking, of course. Mm-hmm. And then a third one, I happened to be in Dayton and a couple that I met lived in Dayton. So I hooked up with them. But the best one is I got the Camino bug. And I will be embarking on a another Camino next April. And I am going to meet up with friends that I met from Australia and the UK. And we're going to walk the Portuguese Camino, which is an entirely different route, but we'll still end up in Santiago. Yeah. Oh, so I'm, Janet, I'm, that's wonderful. I'm really excited about that one. I'll only do half of it. They're starting in Lisbon. I will meet them halfway in Porto. And then it's only two weeks walking to Santiago, which sounds perfect to me. How many kilometers or miles is that? I think 
it's about, I don't even know. I don't even know, Chris. I think it's about 120 <laughs> miles. But you're not very worried about it. I can tell that. You know what? I'm so not worried about it. I'm not worried about what I have to take. I'm not worried about making my travel arrangements. Because one thing I did learn about being in Europe is just get yourself there. I probably will find the cheapest flight to anywhere in Europe and then get a cheap internal flight uh, mm -hmm. to get to Porto to start because I learned how easy that was when I was in Spain. When I finished my Camino last May in Santiago, that's, that is the official ending uh, of, of the Camino. But I didn't go all the way to Europe to walk all the way across Spain only to fall short by 87 kilometers. So I opted to do the alternate Camino, which is to walk from Santiago to Finisterre. That's another three days walk there. And mm -hmm. I did that and spent four days on the coast just kind of relaxing and reflecting mm -hmm. and planning the next adventure and actually there ran into some close friends that I made, you know, one of them being the gentleman from Australia who, who will be part of the walking group in Portugal. So it, it was a really great way to end the Camino. It was a much different vibe. Very few people do it. So it was very serene. Mm -hmm. And then from wow. there, you know, a really, really inexpensive flight to Barcelona to get home. Altogether, I was gone seven weeks, and I had never, ever, ever done anything like that in my life before. So when you got home, did it take a little bit of time to adapt to being back with your car and oh. your house? And... <laughs> As a matter of fact, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's very instinctive of you to ask that because, you know, it's a, it's a common conversation among people who go on the Camino about the difficulty of reentry into real life. Because on the Camino, there's, there's nothing about our real life is part of the day to day life there. I mean, you just get up and you walk and you visit with people and you're much more present and in the moment in these conversations and things are so slow living out of a backpack for me was really liberating i would have this little checklist in my head every day or every time i stood up to to move on i would go through this checklist and go my pack my poles my passport my phone if i had all those four things i had everything and then I could start going. When I got home, I can't tell you how many times I got in my car and then I had to go back in the house. And then I got in my car and had to go back in the house because I was, <laughs> I was so distracted. And I was, and it, there was so much different variety of what I was doing next and what I needed for it. And so it felt complicated, but it also felt rushed. And, you know, even though I'm retired, I can't imagine reentry if I had, had to re-enter and go back to work. That would have been really crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, to catch you know, back up, right. You get back into your routine pretty quickly. I have to say, I didn't, I didn't walk for two weeks after that. And then when I started hiking again, I had to wear some old hiking boots that I had here that always seemed fine, but they <laughs> didn't they didn't feel like the shoes that I wore on the Camino. So I went back to Appalachian Outfitters and told them to look up my account and said, I want to buy the exact same pair of shoes that I bought last September. <laughs> <laughs> the ones that I had left behind on the coast of the Atlantic. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and well, I After did you it. put 500 miles on a pair of shoes, I can see why you'd leave them, right? While you were on your pilgrimage, were you using your phone? Um, my phone was my camera. <laughs> I did okay. not, I opted to not have a data package. There okay. was Wi-Fi available in a lot of the places where you would stop at a cafe or in the hostel that you stayed in. But honestly, it was so sketchy and so slow that it would get frustrating to use. So I probably connected maybe twice a day just to check and make sure I didn't have a text from my kids. Once a day, I was uploading photos, and I did kind of a little mini blog on an app that I used 
to kind of make a daily travel diary for my friends and family to see. And then other than that, my phone was my camera and my only camera. Okay. It's a good thing that I cut the cord with my dependence on you know, social media and the internet and all of that because when I got to Barcelona for the tail end of my trip, I was there for five days and my phone was stolen the first night. Oh, and, uh, you know, I was really upset for a minute and frustrated. And then I, because because I had spent the last six weeks using it so little, I just said, OK, it's just another expense of the trip and I'll be inconvenienced for the flight home because I won't be able to check things or check in. But I opted to do without my phone for the next five days and take care of it when I got back to Akron. I don't think I would have had that same kind of calm attitude if not for the Camino. <laughs> well, also, you had already uploaded yes. your your My photos. photos automatically backed up to the cloud. So I would still be crying about that if, if I'd lost photos. Right. But that yes. was all that yes. mattered to me was the pictures. Okay. I think you've already told us, but um, I was going to ask what's next for you. Oh, well, yes, that Portuguese Camino, definitely. The Camino really just made me bolder in my old age to not wait to be a part of a group that does something, but if I want to do something, I'll just do it. And I don't think I would ever had the courage to do that before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for example, I, I, I want to get the heck out of Akron for the month of January simply because it's not nice here. And so I did some research and I had the courage to rent an apartment in San Miguel de Lende in, in Mexico. And I'm going to go down there and live like a resident for a month and see what that feels like. Wow. That'll yeah, be nice. And I think that'll be exciting. And I know that I'll only be able to survive it or do it if I, I do act like I live there and make an attempt to meet people and talk to people. But now it, that doesn't feel so scary to do that. So I'm going on the trip really did make you bolder. It did. Absolutely. And were there any moments on the trip where you really were thinking, what have I done? Why did I do this? I can't believe I'm here. I mean, did you have low points? Yes. On the trip? There was, uh, there was a point that was actually about 10 days into the Camino. You know, for the first five or six days, I was just in wonder and awe and just having the greatest time. And it was even more beautiful than I expected. And it was still beautiful, but we had a couple of, you know, not nice weather days. And I just so happened to get two albergues which is a hostel, two in a row that I had a cold shower. <laughs> and I thought, oh. <laughs> is this what the whole Camino is going to be like? And I just wasn't feeling it. And I was discouraged and tired and I just had a bad day. And I remember actually putting that on my, on my blog message about I'm not feeling the Camino and, you know, I'm, I'm second guessing this. And when I started out, the only way I had the courage to make the commitment to that six week trip was to tell myself, if I'm not feeling the Camino, you know, one of the advantages of traveling solo is I can change my mind and I don't have to worry about, you know, somebody else's vacation. And so I was discouraged. My son saw that post and he texted me a picture that I had just posted three days before of me with some people in this beautiful setting. And he goes, mom, just remember all of this. I'm sure you'll get it back and you've got this. And that came through in the middle of the night because of the six hour time difference. And I saw that in the morning. It yeah. just, it just made me cry. It was just so sweet. And the next day I had the most wonderful day and my post said, I have my Camino back and <laughs> my son was <laughs> sending all these parts and things. So there was that moment where I was thinking, eh, I don't think I can do this. Uh -huh. And then I had a moment about two weeks before the end where 
I was worried that I couldn't finish the Camino because my foot was hurting so bad. And I ended up, I, I had a self-diagnosed stress fracture in my left foot. And I had hobbled into this hostel and this lovely woman was talking to me and I actually thought she was a medical personnel because she seemed to know what she's talking about, but she was just a mom type. And she <laughs> says, well, I have some KT tape here and we could YouTube a video on exactly how to wrap it for that injury. And we did. And it was, it was great. So I had my foot wrapped for the next two weeks and I was able to make it to the end of the, of the Camino without so much pain. Excellent. Yeah, that and the fact that I had learned that you can send your backpack ahead each day. They have an option in the hostels where, you know, you just fill out an envelope with the name of your destination and the next place you're going to stay and put five euros in the envelope and they will transport your backpack for you. So when I had my my foot when I had my foot injury, I think that's the only way I could have made it is to get rid of all that weight that I was carrying and just walk the day pack. Yeah. So there's all kinds of options. And, and I think that's the thing I would want people to know is, you know, you don't have to go full out pilgrim on this. You, you don't have to suffer to be a pilgrim. You can send your back pack ahead every day. If you want to, you can only walk for a week. You, you know, you don't have to walk the whole six weeks. And the majority of the people that I met were doing sections. I, see. I, I, I met yeah. people from Europe that they said, this is the third time. And, you know, the first year we went from here to there and then we did the next section and then the next section. So they'll string together their Caminos over five different trips to do the whole thing. Ah, and because it's just so easy for them to get there. Yeah. And so that's sort of like how some people do the Appalachian Trail. They break it into yeah, chunks. Yeah, section hiking. Yeah. And, and there's shorter Caminos. You know, this Portuguese Camino is in total only four weeks. And I just chose to do just half of it because two weeks sounds perfect to me. You know, mm-hmm. I proved my point. I can walk five weeks. I don't need to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, I think we have made it to the lightning round. Yes. So basically, we are just going to ask you a series of questions, very quick little questions, and you can answer them quickly or you can elaborate, just whatever feels okay. right to you. Okay. So the first one is coffee or tea? Coffee. Bike or run or swim? Bike, definitely. I I don't have the lungs for swimming. And as I said, I had to give up running years ago. And that decision was driven by my desire to hike until the day I die. So I figured, oh, I better give up running if I want to make sure to do that. Okay. Broccoli or cauliflower? Broccoli. Vegan or paleo? Oh, neither. <laughs> neither. <laughs> neither. I like okay. food too much to restrict myself. <laughs> okay. Um, this one you've already answered, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Gym or park? Oh, definitely the park. I knew you'd say that. <laughs> definitely the park. Eggs or oatmeal? Oh, that's a tough one. Because I like them equally, but I really like a, a really good bowl of steel cut oatmeal. Okay. Yeah. Okay, treadmill or Stairmaster or elliptical? Well, I think I have to answer elliptical because that's the only machine that I have in my house. Oh, okay. Here's a fun one wine or beer? Oh, do I have to choose? <laughs> I, one of the things I love the most uh, about living in Northeast Ohio is the craft beer scene. And mm-hmm. I just love the vibes of the breweries. And, and Yeah, we have some great I know, around. and there's just so much variety in taste of beer. But I have to say, my, you know, I get two full drinking beer. So I 
my go-to is wine, you know, especially after spending an extended trip in Spain. Oh, I was, there was some incredible wines that we got to try there. Kettlebell or dumbbell? Ooh, that's another gym type thing, but I, kettlebell can be fun. And you could say neither. (laughs) I'd say neither, but kettlebells can be fun. Okay. Quinoa or rice? Oh, I love quinoa. I love the texture of it, and I love the, the variety of different dishes you can make of that. Zumba or Pilates? Oh, Zumba, just because it's dancey and it's fun. I did try that for a while. Yeah. You okay. Bread, yes or no? I should say no, but I definitely will eat bread if it's worth it bread, like good bakery crusty bread. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, that sounds great. Well, Janet, you mentioned something about your blog that you kept during the the trip, and we'd like to include that on the show notes so that if someone uh, wanted to actually see a little bit more about it, would that be okay if we included that? Yes, and not that I have anything to do with this app, but for my particular adventure, this app that I used – was so great. It's called Polar Steps. And in this particular app, it actually tracked my movements on a map. So you could, you could actually see, you know, the big trip from Cleveland to Paris at my starting point, and then my traveling to Baritz and, and, and then each little stop along the way. But at each stop where I would pin a stop, it, it allowed me to to write a couple of lines or a couple of paragraphs to describe what I'd experienced and then upload any number of pictures just for that particular day. And uh, it ended up really being a godsend for my kids because my two adult sons had some, some distress over me going off to Europe by myself. (laughs) And from the very beginning, they could see, Oh, She's not, she really isn't alone and she has made friends and this looks amazing and fantastic. So they calmed down (laughs) and stopped worrying. Wonderful. Well, that's great. And uh, we'll go ahead and put a link in our show notes so that listeners can get a a deep dive into your day-to-day activities. That would be great. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for being so open and sharing all of your adventures with us today. Really appreciate it. And I love telling people about it. Maybe I'll inspire somebody else to look further into it and learn more about it. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It was just a delight hearing about Oh, thanks. I really appreciate it, too. Thanks a lot, Janet. We'll talk to you soon. Okay, thanks. Mm Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye. What a great discussion today. Talking with Janet gave me a lot of ideas about incorporating hiking into a vacation or taking a hiking vacation. Yes, I appreciate how willing Janet was to share her experiences with us. I'm sure that many of our listeners enjoy hiking. I know I do. I like to do a lot of hiking and live in an area with lots of hiking trails. And when Janet was talking about taking her children as youngsters on hikes, it made me remember that I used to take my son when he was about four on the local fall hiking spree. And I have such fond memories of that time. Hiking is a great way to spend time with people, with family, friends, or even just by yourself. It's a great activity. I've only done a little bit of hiking in the Allegheny National Forest in Pennsylvania, but really enjoyed listening to Janet's descriptions of hiking the El Camino Trail. Thank you, Janet, for helping us to expand our knowledge about hiking adventures. And for our listeners, we've added the link to Janet's Polar Steps account so that you can take a detailed look at her adventures with over 600 photos. Polar Steps is an app that you can use on your phone. You can download it and log in and follow Janet. Um, I was also able to access it from my computer. So you can just go to the Polar Steps website. I logged in using my Facebook account. Otherwise, you can set up an account. But 
I used Facebook and it was very easy to find Janet. It's really definitely worth doing that because she has some phenomenal photos in here. Thank you also to each of our listeners who are sharing their ideas and thoughts about becoming fit and strong with others too. If you have a friend who you think would enjoy listening to the Becoming Ellie podcast, please be sure to share our podcast with them. And if you have a comment or a request, please send us an email or leave a comment on the podcast or at our website so that we can get back to you. Remember to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss any episodes. You can subscribe to the Becoming Ellie podcast from our website, which is also where you can subscribe to our mailing list. Also, join our private Facebook group. We'll keep you notified when something is published on Becoming Ellie. We'd love to have you join in the discussions as we all work together to become fit and strong as we age. I'm Chris. And I'm Jill. We're looking forward to bringing you another episode of Becoming Ellie very soon. <music>